It was the official policy of the United States government until 1968. In my lifetime and the lifetime of 90 senators who serve today, the official policy of this government was to help white people buy homes and to deny that help to black people. And because the federal government had set the standard, private lenders enthusiastically followed in Washington's lead. Homes are the way that millions of working families build some economic security. They pay down a mortgage and own an asset that, over time, often appreciates. A home serves as security to fund other ventures, to start a small business, or to send a youngster to college. And if grandma and grandpa can hang on to the home and get it paid off, they can often pass along an asset that boosts the finances of the next generation and the one after that. And that's exactly what white people have done for generations, but not black people. Systematically, over many decades, government policies that encouraged mortgage companies to lend only to white borrowers cut the legs out from underneath minority families trying to build some family wealth. And the result has been exactly what you'd predict. It's contributed to a staggering gap of wealth between white communities and communities of color today. Here's one statistic from Massachusetts. According to the Boston Globe, the median net worth of white families living in Boston is $247,500. And the median net worth for a black family is $8. That's something that all Americans, regardless of race, should be ashamed of. When I was traveling around the country in the aftermath of the financial crisis, it became clear to me that the crash had made the problem worse. Subprime lenders who had peddled mortgages full of tricks and traps had specifically targeted minority borrowers. That meant that during the Great Recession, a huge number of minority borrowers lost their homes. And when rising home prices helped white Americans regain some financial security, communities of color with their lower home ownership rates and their higher foreclosure rates were often left behind. Again, just one example. According to Pew, between 2010 and 2013, the median wealth of white households grew by 2.4%, but the wealth of Hispanic households in that same time fell by 14.3%, and the wealth of African American households fell by 33%. Mortgage discrimination didn't end in the 1960s when formal redlining policies were abolished. It didn't end with the tightening of mortgage rules following the financial crisis. Lending discrimination is still alive and well in America in 2018. According to a new report that just came out from the Center for Investigative Reporting and Reveal, in 2015 and 2016, nearly two-thirds of mortgage lenders de denied loans for people of color at higher rates than for white people. This problem affects both big lenders and small lenders, and it's nationwide. Minority borrowers were more likely to be denied a mortgage than white borrowers with the same income in 61 different cities across America. And how do we know that? Because of Humda data. That's how we can see how much black families were charged for a mortgage or how often Latino families were denied a chance to take out a mortgage. And we can compare those numbers with white borrowers who have the same incomes and same credit scores. But we can't do that if the data are missing. It is impossible to detect and fight mortgage discrimination without Honda data. The bill on the banking on the floor of the Senate says that 85% of banks will no longer be required to report Honda data, including the borrower's credit score and age, the loans points, fees and interest rate, and the property value. 85%. These data are essential to figuring out 
whether the borrower got a fair deal or not. If this bill passes, there will be entire communities where there won't be enough data to figure out whether borrowers are getting ripped off. Entire communities where it will be impossible to monitor whether people are getting cheated because of their race or gender. Entire communities where federal and state regulators won't be able to bring cases and independent groups like Reveal won't be able to hold these groups accountable. Sure, banks will save a little money by not having to fill out the Humda data, but when communities of color are once again left behind, there will be no way to prove it. And that's why civil rights groups around the country have spoken up against this bill. The Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights said, and I'm quoting, exempting the overwhelming majority of our nation's banks and credit unions from an expanded humda requirement that would better enable federal regulators, state attorneys general, fair housing advocates, and others to identify and address discriminatory and predatory mortgage practices is unwise. The Urban League and the National Community Reinvestment Coalition wrote in a newspaper column that the bill, quote, would be a giant step backwards for the public and national groups who use this data to ensure that banks treat all borrowers equally. And according to the NAACP, the bill, quote, would devastate our attempts to determine and potentially rectify racially discriminatory lending or loan approval patterns at play. This is about basic fairness. Humda data is an investment we should be making to make sure that all qualified Americans have the same chance to buy a home. Throughout our history, Washington has always fallen short of that goal. Gutting Humda allows our country and our government to ignore discrimination, letting history repeat itself. Communities of color will pay the price if this Congress makes the same mistakes again. It isn't too late. We can stop this bill from becoming law.